Hello everyone, I'm Josie Warden and I'm Head of Regenerative Design here at the RSA and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation where we'll be exploring the role that community energy could play <clears throat> in the future of the energy sector. We've got a fantastic panel ready to explore this subject with me, so let's meet them. First up is Amina Camps. Amina is a Commissioner on the Just Transition Commission Scotland and also a Director of Community Energy Scotland. Our next speaker, Duncan Law, is the acting co-chief executive at Community Energy England. And our final speaker, Laura Sands, is chair of the government's Energy Digitalisation Task Force and chair of the British Standards Institute Advisory Board on Net Zero. So welcome all. It's great to have you here today. Um, we know that energy is an essential part of all our lives, but along with the kind of global systems which generate and deliver it, it can often feel really invisible um, until maybe the kind of pain points or problems arise in it. And many or perhaps even all of us in the UK maybe struggle to understand it or and much less feel like we have agency to make change in it. But we also know that we're in the midst of a really critical energy revolution with the IPP, IPCC report out this week, again showing that we really need the shift towards renewables and fast. Um, and the long awaited UK government energy strategy is also out this week. And on top of the price volatility that was already being experienced, Russia's war in the Ukraine has sharpened our focus on energy security. And at the RSA, we think that everyone should be able to participate and benefit from a better future. So we know that the role that people can play in making change is really key. And that's why I think this conversation is such an important one. Um, I wonder if we can start with some wider reflections upon the current energy price crisis and what it has revealed about the state of the energy sector. And Laura, I know there is so much we could say on this, but I wonder if you could tell us what observations you think are particularly relevant for us to note here at the beginning of our discussion before we then delve more deeply into the role of community energy. Josie, thank you so much. And it's great to be on this panel. Um, I mean, I think that some of these price rise, well, not some, these price rises are quite shocking for lots of families up and down the country. And um, I think that we've always had, in many ways, a super disconnect between consumers and energy. I mean, I don't know that many people who really understand what a kilowatt hour is. I mean, this is a totally incomprehensible and very distant market for consumers. And, I used to represent an area where the average wage was 16 and a half thousand pounds a year. And what the absolute key issue was, was the energy bill was the toxic bill because it was the one that was unpredictable. And in many ways, what we need to do is to reshape the retail market quite significantly and actually deliver customers a decarbonization dividend. Um, there are many ways that I'm sure we'll discuss today, but you know, one is to decouple cheaper renewables from the fossil fuel market. The idea that we're paying Putin's prices for fixed assets that sit right way around the country that we've paid for up front already is absolutely crazy. And the retail market also incentivizes selling more energy rather than actually providing value to those customers. So we need to have a very, very big rethink of that particular, the retail uh, market and how it impacts consumers. But I feel very much for many people around the country who are facing these high bills. Thanks very much, Laura. And I know the conversation around recovery from the crisis must also factor into the challenge of delivering a green transition. And Amina, where do you think the biggest obstacles are on this journey? And maybe how can lessons from the current crisis be factored into plans for change and development in the future? Thanks, Josie. Well, personally, I feel as Laura, it's, uh, it's part of a much bigger picture. And the biggest obstacles are actually associated with the, an economic and cultural shift that's required. Um, despite many experts in, in the field of economics and social, social research discussing the need for change and options for this change, we are still largely focused on a system that supports large profit for the few, while many are unable to pay their bills or heat their homes. We cannot solve the climate and the biodiversity crisis without addressing social inequalities and a shift to a well-being economy requires a shift in mindset, both locally, nationally and globally, of course, because we are all part of a global system. I think one of the greatest lessons from the current crisis 
is the current system doesn't work for the many. So how are we going to change this? It also highlights how important resilience is and that shows a growing need to be less dependent on those wholesale sale prices, which is what Laura was talking about. So greater support for local generation and supply could actually help build that resilience and that leads into the community energy topic. Great, thanks very much, Amina. Yeah, I think we're already seeing so far the complexity of these conversations. Um, but yeah, Duncan, I think building on that point for me, I'd like to bring you in here to talk a bit about the role that community energy could play in this transition. Could you explain to us what we mean when we speak about community energy and maybe give some examples of ongoing projects? Yes, very happily. Thank you. Um, community energy is basically people getting together in their communities to do energy projects that uh, address climate change and deliver social benefit. And I started, um, I, I started a transition town in Brixton uh, back in 2007-8 and uh, in about 2010 we decided we had to focus on energy so we set up Brixton Energy which put uh, solar power stations on the top of social housing roofs and out of that came uh, Repowering London which is a very powerful player that's helped Hackney and Vauxhall and uh, North Kensington and uh, is spreading the love and the knowledge and the model. Um, there are other brilliant projects all over the country and uh, a great place to look for um, inspiring examples is the Carbon Copy uh, website uh, which I think will appear magically as a link uh, or on the Community Energy England uh, website um, uh, but there are projects in uh, Bristol where um, there's a, a wonderful project called the Cheese Project which is uh, um, uh, people uh, doing uh, thermal images of houses and discovering where the leakages are and then uh, talking to the residents and saying we can save you hundreds of pounds a year they're also putting up the biggest single wind turbine that, were, that whose energy and profits will benefit one of the poorest communities in, in, in Bristol, uh, Lawrence Weston. There are amazing projects in Oxford, which I know Laura knows a lot about, the project LEO, which is experimenting with uh, microgrids and the benefits that directly can uh, be brought to, to residents. Um, the traditional model is solar on roofs uh, funded by government subsidies but that since the subsidies and more or less all support for community energy has been withdrawn by government community energy is diversifying and combining technologies and business models to do incredibly innovative and and uh, uh, imaginative things and, and businesses are knocking on the door because what they get uh, when they do a project like that with community energy is a community test bedded uh, experiment uh, that, that proves whether something works with people. Um, so that, that's community energy. I think, um, uh, I mean, this point about the, the, the sort of culture change that is necessary is fundamental. We cannot do net zero, and the Committee on Climate Change is clear about this, without engaging with the people. And that can be, you know, a big government advertising campaign, which as we know from uh, falling icebergs and don't die of ignorance, doesn't really work what is much more functional is to get people involved in local visible beneficial projects um, which normalize the change and that produces a deep and a lasting uh, change in the way people identify and interact with energy which is fundamentally what we need and at the same time can bring huge social benefits to those people um, one of the things that the, 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 the current crisis has shown is that the government's response tends to be dealing with the symptoms. How can we help people pay for their fuel? Well, there are other ways of looking at that. You know, uh, energy isn't a thing. It's, it, it delivers a service to us. It delivers heat or this computer working. And if we can look at it from that side, we can supply it in other ways. It, Fuel poverty is also warmth deficit and we have the leakiest homes in the UK and yet there is no systemic process within government to address that. Community energy is brilliant at delivering energy efficiency to people, saving them hundreds of pounds, saving tons of carbon and improving health, well-being, um, social outcomes at the same time and health costs. Thanks very much, Duncan. I think it's really interesting, even in this discussion so far, the kind of shift in narrative from a huge kind of energy systems down to actually what that means for individuals 
uh, how they experience it in their lives, but also what it might mean for them to be involved in changes. And I wonder, Amina, would you be able to share some examples of what it means for people to be involved in energy projects like this? What are the kind of changes that you see and um, and maybe is it does it offer kind of greater potential, as Duncan was saying, for them to be kind of more engaged in other kinds of conversations around their local area too that might go beyond energy? Yeah, certainly. I mean, one of the projects I was in, I've been involved in for a, a number of years is US Twin, and um, and what we really saw was um, a lot of excitement about local energy production. Um, and it empowers the community to come together on these issues um, and, and see a way forward and provide some hope. Um, we must realize that, it, I mean, we're not just fight, uh, suffering from an energy crisis, we're actually suffering from the, the impacts of numerous crises on top of one another and, and people are exhausted, you know, and, and, and now we've just coming out of COVID and what hit, hits us, huge electricity increases so people can't afford their bills i mean people were struggling already now they're really struggling so that hope is really important and that's where the community sector comes in is to provide that empowerment so they say okay we can address this together we can solve our problems together and the other thing it does is um it makes people think about where their energy is coming from and how it's it's delivered how it's stored um how it gets to that plug that we plug in our laptop where we plug in our laptop um so that in itself embeds a greater understanding of the energy system and what it actually means to people and that greater understanding and that educational side of community energy means that it can also impact behavioral change it's like the disconnection with nature we're disconnected from our energy system because we used to just being able to turn on a, on a socket. So it gets people thinking about the energy system that otherwise we probably would be ignoring because we're too busy worrying about our bills and <laughs> our everyday lives. Um, however, there's a, there's a challenge of course in that is that because people are exhausted and people are overworked, um, from my, um, certainly my experience, the community energy sector is heavily dependent on pass, uh, local capacity and volunteer capacity. Um, and, it, and it tends to depend on an, a number of individual uh, volunteers who uh, are overworked and volunteer on all the different boards and everything that's going on in the community. So capacity is really key, capacity building and um, funding for actual like project officers, development officers on the ground, rather than this over-dependence on, on volunteers, that it's great to get as many people involved as possible, but we shouldn't underestimate the need for actual on the ground capacity to support that process. Thank you. And yeah, it sounds like from what you said and what Duncan was saying too, maybe the conditions that would enable more of this to happen are not necessarily in place and I wonder if Laura you had any thoughts on why that might be the case and obviously community energy is not it's not a new idea maybe why it hasn't so far been a bigger part of the of the kind of transition that we need to see. I mean I'm absolutely totally um, sold on community energy um, I think what we've got to understand is that there isn't one silver bullet and we will need a lot of different energy sources and picking up on Amina's point you know there are some people who just can't engage because they haven't got the time, they've got three kids, three jobs, etc. So let's also look at where community energy can be successful, but also understand that, um, you know, citizens have lives as well. And I've always found this sector very amusing because it's always asked, asked me, the energy sector asks me to be a heating engineer and an electrical engineer, right? That's what it's saying to me. And actually, I, on one hand, I think we need to get out of people's lives. And there is a really, I mean, for me, I have a dream. And my dream is that energy becomes a business to business product rather than directly to consumers. So for example, if I had a car and it was an EV car, I would lease it with 300 miles embedded in it. And I actually wouldn't even see the energy because it would be part of my service contract. And I think, you know, whether that be 
Um, you know, so for example, I'm on this computer. I don't really have any visibility of the data I'm using because I have a contract. And in some ways we need to start to think about lots of different consumer models. Now, I personally believe in, you know, lots of common ownership because I think these assets, particularly when they're located in places, actually people need to get the, the, the benefits from it. So you've got common ownership, you've got a service model, you've got energy embedded in products, which actually allow um, me to be distant from it. I, I think we need to open this whole market up, not talk about silver bullets and really offer an opportunity for consumers to have control, which is what Amina said, no control over this current bill, um, where they can involve themselves if that's absolute, if that's what they want to do. But if they don't, then it must be, we, the system must do the heavy lifting for the citizen. And I think that we need to ensure that that's the case. There's a really great um, project that, or proposal that the Northern Irish government is coming up with or has, has presented. And that is in each town, they would have um, a, a net zero hub, which would absolutely help customers understand whether it be energy efficiency, whether it be a local project, whether it be um, how to, you know, how to buy a heat pump. I mean, who knows how many people you've got to talk to to buy these basic things. Um, and in some ways we need to get very much closer to the customer and whether that be a community energy project in your area, do get involved, that sounds fab. If it's what I need is lagging, then who's the best supplier in the area? You know, we, we need to lean in to people's needs, not always having our own models that actually sort of predetermine um, the public's requirements. And we're all different. That's what's so fabulous. Yeah, that sense that there are so many different ways that need to be directly moved towards to address this feels really, really important. And I think I want to pick up what you said there around common ownership, because I'm wondering too if there is a shift with at the moment, we have a, very, a system very much where it's the kind of um, you have a relationship as a consumer with an energy company. Um, but actually, this model that we're talking about here with community energy is, is also bringing in that communal element, that sense of how do we own something or how do we develop something as a community. Um, and I'm wondering, um, Duncan or Amina, if you think that that kind of communal bit is really important because it maybe offers up different ways of, of developing energy systems. Yes, I think I think community is incredibly important. Um, we live in unstable times and resilience is about interconnection. It's about uh, being able to rely on something, being knowing where help will come from. We saw it in the in the COVID crisis. People pulled together. The mutual aid was just extraordinary and delivered stuff at scale that the government, even local government, simply couldn't do. Um, the other thing about communities is that you, you're with your circle of people and when you get with that circle of people and start to work with them, you get all sorts of social benefits as well. Um, you, you develop new friends, but also you develop new sense of possibility and that brings, as Amina was saying, that brings hope and, you know, the, 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 all the resources and, the, and the, the, the power that getting involved in the solution brings you. The other thing we need to do about zero and about the, the transformation that we need in all aspects of life, we really need to reimagine the way we do everything to come through this, um, is that is that that we need to that needs to be kind that change needs to be normalized. So once somebody has um, installed a heat pump and talked to their neighbors about it and said it's not really a big deal, or externally insulated their house. Once the projects are there, known about within communities, visible, delivering benefit, then suddenly they will become, there will be a wave which will drive them forward. Um, the other thing to say is of course, local is where it's at. It's where people live. It's where most decisions about energy are taken, about transport. Most journeys are less than two, two kilometers. You know, you can choose whether to walk them, cycle them, drive them, take public transport. 
energies around you know the, the use of energy around the house that's decided locally and local it has got to be the future of energy at the moment the government is still seeing it as a big supply side project we're going to fuel the status quo with the wind that blew drake in the north sea well no we're not unless we can actually get people to identify and see that how much they use has an effect on as people have been talking the amount of gas we have to buy from putin or the amount of stuff we have to burn and the amount of climate change we're creating then we're simply not going to negotiate that change and the the benefit of empowering people to do the generation the sensible use of energy and the balancing job that needs to happen as a result is hugely powerful but it needs pump priming by government and the problem is that they're very much focusing on the big tech business focused um, solutions when and not supplying any support to communities and people to do it locally thank you i think it sounds like from what you were saying there and also what laura you were saying just now that sense of actually that local is really important and that can be delivering generation of energy but it can also be the support that supports people to change the demand side of energy and not just looking at the kind of supply overall whether it's the kind of hubs that you were mentioning Laura or whether it's um, examples like you gave earlier um, Duncan of the of the work in Bristol um, why do you think um, I wonder Amina if you come on this why do you think maybe there are such challenges on looking at more of that local and that kind of demand side change within kind of government positions and policy positions um, from a policy perspective, I'm not sure because the community sector have been talking about what's been needed for quite a long time now. Um, from a community perspective, there are um, obstacles that do hold it back, such as um, legislative trade changes that are required. Um, the local electricity bill is a, is a key one that's uh, been promoted by um, powerful people. And um, it, you know, the, 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 to give communities a choice to not only generate their own electricity to, but also to sell locally in a, a local electricity market um, due to the bureaucracy and the great expense of setting up your own supply company um, that limits the potential for that and and certainly from the engagement that we've been doing on a, a local energy plan um, in newest you know that's the big question that communities are constantly asking okay so we've got these wind turbines but why can't we buy that electricity why isn't that supplying our homes and why is it exported and then we go into these legislative barriers as well as there's um there's big barriers in terms of the grid um you know both in terms of constraints but also uh, limited flexibility uh, the need for local electricity grids um and then I think it comes back to that bigger picture again. It's it's the uh, understanding, the strategic, holistic overview of everything that needs to happen um, to meet these various crises. For example, um, in terms of a communal a communal system that um, Duncan was just talking about, um, that could also go hand in hand with meeting some of the housing housing problems. You know, because if you're if you're building new housing schemes, um, you could have local electricity supply <laughs> at, in that housing development. You could also meet some food challenges by having a local food growing co cooperative as part of that housing scheme. So every as uh, which is similar to what um, and but of course it's all about choice as well. So. If people don't want it, if, if people would prefer buying it and, and being disconnected from that energy system, then they need that choice. Um, so it's quite a complex picture. Um, and getting to grips with that big picture is very challenging. <laughs> um, so it is, it's, it's, it's looking at the broader landscape and then saying, OK, there, there's a roadblock, there's a roadblock. How do we remove that? And then how do we also provide all these various options that Laura was talking about to make sure that people have choice on how they meet their energy needs? I wonder, Laura, do you think that complexity is part of the reason why perhaps policy seems more focused on these big kind of technological shifts? Because if we were looking at 
looking at kind of community um, based work that that also is a lot of complexity around the needs of different people is that is that I think a driver for there to be looking at more of that scale and more of that technology and and particularly the sort of supply side challenges I mean I, I think we probably all recognize um, <clears throat> politicians like um, cutting ribbons on big things you know so there's that and there is a lot of micro barriers that sort of sit around community energy. And those micro barriers, they sit in different departments. So there's all sorts of complexity. So you, you couldn't have a community energy bill because it would cover maybe three or four different departments, right? So you've got those institutional barriers um, and that, creates problems. I mean, I do actually think that everything to do with politics is much better to show, not tell. And as both Duncan and Amina have already, you know, they've got projects up and running. Um, it's all about looking to see how those can be scaled. But, but I do think we just can't say that community energy is the silver bullet. It is one of this patchwork of layered um, energy resilience and um, renewable um, assets that need to be on board. But one of the things that's interesting about community energy, and I don't know whether Duncan and Amina will um, metaphorically throw, throw something at me, um, and that is actually, I think that there's a massive opportunity for what I would call community flexibility rather than energy. And the community flexibility is, we look, let's look at the future of a renewable world, right? The weather does not take price signals. It does not follow legislation. And if we look into the future, not the very far future, we will find that actually flexibility, consumer demand profiles, um, digitalization, new assets within communities, um, are going to be 70 to 80, possibly 90% of how we balance the grid. And what I'm absolutely passionate about is that that value of balancing the grid, which in 2019 was 1.2 billion pounds. This year, I think it will be 2 billion pounds, right? Needs to go to those consumers, those citizens who are actually doing the work. Now, currently, the, the money doesn't flow through. The money stops at the supply side and the money does not flow through to the demand. So I would love to see um, community demand projects, which are really, and I know Duncan, you know, the Leo project, there, there are those going on, but actually it's that that is in many ways what the system will need, but customers, have to be rewarded and that's where communities can start doing things whether they build you know um whether they buy a sort of community battery whether they do this whether they do that i need to be rewarded for the work that i am doing to support this system and that's what's really important i wonder duncan if you've got yeah anything you want to add on to that <laughs> Yes, I agree with all of that. Um, uh, and, and I agree with Laura about, I mean, the whole, the essence of the future of the energy system is a decentralised energy system where uh, as much local generation happens as is possible. All those wasted rooftops, you know, just think about it. Um, and then the what what is used is balanced with what can be supplied. And then there is a, a, a process of storage in buildings, in batteries, um, that 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 helps smooth it out. The problem is at the moment. I was just on uh, calls this morning about this very subject. It's simply not possible for community energy and, and and not for very many commercial people to actually make flexibility to to take flexibility initiatives. There simply isn't enough money. It's one of the key areas that needs pump priming, and there isn't any signal that that that's really happening. Um, Community energy is involved in dozens of innovative projects, but none of them can see a way to market. Um, uh, Laura wants to come in. No, no, no. I'm just really interested because um, the energy system operator have said that by 2030, there'll be enough EV cars 
on the system that will be the equivalent of two nuclear power stations. Okay. So, and there are companies that are actually unlocking those EV cars into mm. the balancing market, etc. And so there is reward coming through. It just needs to be the whole system reward and really start to unlock. And we did some work with Frontier Economics and the Bayes modeling team to show that an EV van would deliver 500 to 700 pounds per annum to the system. But currently it doesn't get that money because there is blockages within how the, the, the system is designed. And just very briefly on the policy point, my, the, the, the problem with uh, doing things like energy efficiency is of, uh, and community energy is that it's, it's difficult, acknowledge that, it's granular, the, but the thing is that the, the problem with the energy system is it is as individual as the people who use it and the houses that it is used in. Um, and there isn't a lobby for even for the energy efficiency or the retrofit, whereas there is a lobby on the supply side. Uh, and it's much easier uh, for government to write a big check um, to a, a well-organized lobby of people who will tell them exactly what they're going to do with it. Uh, and the other problem is, that, of course, that there is no profit margin you can take on not using energy. So uh, it, it's it, it's a Cinderella who really, really, really needs looking after. Yeah, Mina, would you like to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to know as well, another issue on, in terms of the policy side is, is, is short-termism, which of course is, is part of our political system. And the funding tends to align with that short-term approach. And certainly in the community sector, it's becoming increasingly challenging where there is some of this, this funding to initiate some innovation in the sector, but it comes very last minute. So, and then you've got like three months to spend money to create some amazing project that just is not feasible within that time period. Um, so it, it's an inefficient way of spending funding when it needs a much more structural approach with long-term projects to actually to create this change that's needed. Sorry, Duncan, you were going to come in as well. <laughs> no, I just, I, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, we're just seeing the end of the Rural Community Energy Fund and, and the Environmental Audit Committee urged the government to put in place uh, practical support measures and policy and remove barriers to enable the growth of community energy because, uh, as Laura once said, um, citizens have a veto on net zero and if citizens don't get on board or say no then all the vast investment in the tech solutions and the supply side are just going to be wasted because we will have failed to make it um, and it seems to me that the simple ask for a, a national consistent net uh, uh, community energy fund which enables the amazing leaders in the community to take opportunities whenever they arise and do projects as and when rather than as currently you have to get into bed with the policy agenda of your local authority you then have to download uh, try and be part of a regeneration project and get some capital funding from the leveling up fund or the shared prosperity fund we don't need capital funding we just need seed funding to enable the community energy projects to bring projects to an investable stage and then a few million quid will mobilize hundreds of millions of community capital that might otherwise not even go into net zero to do projects that otherwise would not happen. And one must not forget that you look at a pavement, you see the big slabs, but actually the life lives in the cracks. And when you add up the spaces in the cracks, they add up to a sizable proportion of the pavement. And that's where the fertility is. And that's where the seed funding should go, because that's where, you know, we can do amazing uh, individual, locally appropriate stuff, and we're simply not getting it. Thanks, Duncan. And I wonder, we're getting quite close to time, but with um, Amina and Laura, is there anything you'd like to add on that sense of actually innovation? Like, what, what would it take to support this innovation that kind of building on what Duncan was saying there? No, I mean, I would totally agree. And to be frank, whether it be community money or whether it be sort of larger funds, I mean, there is 
so much money being put in place to support net zero, right? I mean, it's everywhere. The problem is they haven't got the projects, right? And in many ways, it's sort of Duncan and Amina's leadership that actually helps some of these companies with this capital to actually give them a distributed model. So again, it comes back down. I mean, smart meters were an interesting thing. A lot of big funders went into smart metering, right? Which is a distributed asset deployment. We can do this, but it does need what Duncan and Mina say, is it needs a framework, a structure that allows each of these pro projects not to be identical, but to be replicable and to give a clarity of the route to market, both for the community and for those people putting in money, whether it be community people or outside people. So I think that we need to sort of standardize to allow tailoring. Does that make any sense? <laughs> And Amina, is there anything you'd like to add as we kind of draw to a close? I think Duncan and Laura have summarised it really, but I think in terms of the community sector, we shouldn't underestimate how innovative it is. And there are a lot of ideas out there. There's a hell of a lot of interest in doing things, but there's these roadblocks that people keep hitting. And what we need to do is remove those roadblocks, remove the obstacles so they can actually just fly with these innovative ideas, you know, in the various different communities. And yes, absolutely. It is like a, a local based approach because each community is different. But then we need a standardized approach as well with a strategic <laughs> structure for that to follow. Um, so, yeah, it's really the. The last point is just let people fly with their imagination and their innovation, support that process, and then we will see the change that needs to happen. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And I know we're just really scratching the surface of what is such a huge um, and important conversation too. I think some of the things that I've really drawn from this are that, that kind of the shift in mindset, it feels like around what collective or community could mean there's a kind of importance around community voice like how are people engaged and involved in these conversations conversations about ownership whether that is energy assets or whether that is ownership of the kind of um, demand side as well within your space um, but also I really want, like what you, what you said Amina earlier about the kind of communal challenge too that this goes beyond energy the challenges we're facing today so actually how does this also connect in with the um, challenges around biodiversity around inequality etc because it feels like maybe that's also where people can engage in this conversation that otherwise as you were saying at the beginning Laura can feel very very far away and very much about um, technical aspects that people don't kind of connect with so thank you so much for the conversation I yeah really enjoyed it and I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing more of how this develops in the future um, that's all we've got time for today so thank you so much to Amina Duncan and Laura for your contributions and thank you all for watching make sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date with the latest information from the RSA and RSA events and on our website, you'll also find out more information about our Regenerative Futures programme, which is looking at how people can be really involved in shaping the future of our, um, of our planets. So thank you so much and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.